Hello and welcome to In Focus with Insight. My name is Pamela Hillig. I'm head of Insight Life Solutions. And this is an episode of the Open Books series in which we get to know fascinating and inspiring people in the actuarial and insurance community through the books that they have read and loved. Today, I'm joined by the president of the Actuarial Society of South Africa, Costa Economo. Costa is the CEO and founder of Colorfield Liability Solutions, a liability-driven investment management boutique, the first and largest of its kind in South Africa, responsible for managing assets in respect to parastatal, government, municipal, and corporate-sponsored institutional investors. Costa is a qualified actuary, holds an MBA from the University of Chicago uh, Booth School of Business, and is a CFA charter holder, amongst many other qualifications. He used to be an executive director and senior actuary at Alexander Forbes Financial Services, having worked there from 1992 to 2009. He is a former commissioner appointed by the President of South Africa to serve on the Independent Commission for the Remuneration of Public Office Bearers. Welcome, Costa. Good to be here. Thank you, Pamela. Costa, tell me, are you a reader? I am a reader. I love books. I love learning. Um, so, yes. Very definitely. So happy to hear that um, because this isn't like your normal podcast interview in which we will get to know you and talk about things you're busy with and passionate about, but with the added, added angle of the books that have shaped you in some way. So you can think of it as the desert island discs for bibliophiles. I'm, being, I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no need to be little book lovers here. Yeah. But yeah, let's get started with a bit about you. What are you busy with these days? Uh, at the moment, I'm particularly busy in our industry, sort of October, November uh, of every year is a very busy time in the retirement fund and investment space. Lots of trustee meetings, lots of report backs, lots of proposals, lots of presentations. So that's keeping me really busy. The Actuarial Society is also keeping me exceptionally busy. We're on a roadshow where we're meeting uh, a number of employers, of which Insight will be one, uh, where we're talking about what's going on in ASA um, and sharing ideas with the employers. So quite a lot of work on that particular front. And of course, as we as we close in on the on the convention, um, quite a lot of preparatory work that's needed for that. So busy with that. And then I sit on a number of uh, boards and it's the sort of board cycle. Um, uh, and that is also keeping me very, very busy. Um, I also have a set of twins who are, who are in the trick at the moment. Yes. So there's quite a lot of stress in the household, um, uh, but yes, uh, which which is why this is a, a welcome respite <laughs> from all of that. Uh, so thank you very much for the uh, for, for for the opportunity to step off the the treadmill and and um, you know just talk about things that are more fun. So thank you. Yeah, I think we all need that once in a while. And um, do you think your twins will? follow in your footsteps and become actuaries? Well, I look, I, I know one of them is contemplating it. So he is the more sort of studious of the two. Um, they're both very different. It really is chalk and cheese. You know, when they talk about star signs and how people born on a particular day um, share similar traits, similar characteristics, well, my set of twins are the antithesis of one another. Um, and so, uh, you know, puts to bed the argument that it actually holds true. So they are very different. Um, the one is actually contemplating actuarial science or engineering. I'm not sure, uh, you know, I'm not sure uh, what he'll end up doing, but my sense is that he probably will become, or at least try to become an actuary. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure um, he'll share lots of pearls of wisdom with them along the way. Yeah. Before we get into the books that you brought along, I'd like to hear a bit about your reading habits and, um, you know, your relationship with books. So. How would you describe your relationship with with reading and with books? Um, so, so I think I think when I was at school, uh, reading was the one thing I actually did not do. So you did not do enough of. So I've, I grew up in a Greek home, um, and the Greek home uh, meant that after school, I'd invariably do one of two things: I'd either I'd either be in the shop working with my parents or helping my parents out, uh, or going to Greek school uh, where I was learning to read, write, and speak Greek. Uh, so culturally, that's kind of like what we we, we did. Um, so there was very little time afforded sort of growing up um, in terms of uh, access to books. And of course, back in those days, you know, prior to the internet and the ability to download books uh, at your convenience, you'd have to go to a library and, and the library was quite some distance away from where we lived. So it wasn't, it wasn't a very thing to, a very easy thing to access. I then got into university and of course, you know, the, the, the nature of the books I, I was reading were just textbooks, you know, maths and stats and actuarial science or the textbooks. And, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, I didn't enjoy the, 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 the learning part of the actuarial degree. Uh, actually, I enjoyed the social aspect of, of being at a university. 
I didn't really enjoy the academic sort of part of it. So I wasn't particularly studious or a very good student. And it was only once I, I finished university that I actually accidentally got into a, a, a sort of an actuarial position. And at that point, um, I started working for what remains to be one, one of my most inspiring sort of uh, people, uh, the CEO of the group. Um, and it was him that basically got me motivated to pursue the career and, and, and become an actuary. Um, and so, so my early sort of journey in books was really just academia and, and sort of the work that was needed to basically qualify. When I finished um, the, the qualification, it was at that point that I started picking up books. Um, and, and I must say, I found, I found them an amazing escape. Um, I, you know, I, I generally look to read, you know, fiction, um, you know, and, 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 and really just to escape and, and, and you know, uh, just enjoy that, that escape. But then about 10 years later, um, after having qualified, I, you know, I went back to studying and, and, um, the nature of the books that I was then reading were more along the lines of, you know, economics books, textbooks on, you know, uh, uh, corporate finance and, and, and that sort of thing. So, so I read a lot. Um, I've spent a lot of time reading and, and I continue to read a lot I mean, and, and it, it sort of uh, takes its turn from stuff that I'm doing in terms of, uh, some sort of program or academic type sort of, uh, program. And when I'm not doing that, I'll, I'll sort of dive into, um, fiction stories, um, because I, I quite enjoy those. Um, and I'm, I'm more a book lover than I am, um, somebody that likes to see the movie of that same book. Um, so, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's more about the book and the way it's, it's been written and, and, you know, I kind of like immerse myself in that imagination and, and, and I'm, I'm quite an, an imaginative sort of person. I um, mean, so, so I kind of like create my own sort of story in my head. Um, and, 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 and I, I love that. I really do. When you create those stories in your head, do you cast famous actors as the characters? I, I actually do. Yeah. So, so I kind of like think of, of what they might look like or what they should look like. And then when, uh, if, and when the movie does come out, um, you know, it's, it's, it's often with disappointments that the person I imagined, um, is not quite the person that's there, you know? So, so yeah, so, so there's, there's, there's a book that I read, um, uh, about three or four years ago. In fact, it was probably about five years ago, the, the gentleman in Moscow. Um, yeah. and, uh, I must say that it was a tough book to get through. It's beautifully written. It's, it's probably the, uh, probably the most well-written book I've ever read. Um, it took me about four months to get through it. Um, I was, because I was it's going, long or because it's heavy going. It's heavy going. It's, it's okay. quite heavy going. The, the language is, is, is heavy, um, but, but beautifully written. And, um, look, I was also quite busy at work, um, during that time. Um, and so by the time I got to read the book, which is normally at night as I'm, you know, as I'm sort of getting into bed um I'm, I'm i'm quite exhausted and so you know whereas i'd like to get through a chapter and uh i invariably get through you know maybe half a paragraph and i'm fast asleep and but that was a beautifully written book and and mm -hmm. they've recently uh created a production that's now on apple tv uh, which i have downloaded but i'm loath to actually watch it because i just loved the book so much and i just don't want to be disappointed by it by the show. So I'm waiting to get some feedback on the show from people that I know love the book, um, who are, are, are looking at the show. Um, and so we'll, yeah, we'll see what, what that sort of pans out to be. Yeah. So Gentleman in Moscow is you know, one of the books that you, that we're discussing today. What is the plot of, of that? So it's basically a guy who, um, was part of the bourgeoisie, um, pre the, the Russian revolution, um, yeah. and, uh, you know, part of the elite, um, and effectively he comes back into Moscow and, uh, uh, is then placed under house arrest in a hotel. Um, and it's really the story of how things around him started changing, you know, with, with the advent of communism, um, the fall of the czar, um, kind of like how his, how his in, engagements with people had to change and, and what was going on around him, um, given what he was used to and where he came from. Um, so it's really a person that is, is, you know, enjoyed privilege, um, you know, significant privilege up until that point, uh, suddenly that being robbed of him, uh, and, 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 you know, seeing communist ideology sort of filtering through, um, uh, it's a fascinating story. Um, uh, and it's, uh, you know, just the English, um, is just beautifully written, you know, like it's just beautiful English. And so, so anybody looking for a good book, I would, I would strongly recommend it. It's an amazing book to read, but, but it is heavy reading. 
It is heavy. Okay. Where, where do you get your recommendations from? Uh, it's mostly friends. It's mostly okay. friends and people that I know that read, um, uh, who, who, who share with me, um, kind of like, you know, their books and, and, and so that's, that's, that's typically how it works. Yeah. Okay. And you like reading for the language. I yeah. I love the language. Yeah. Um, you know, I like to learn, um, you know, words. Um, and, and again, it's, it's kind of like the story, um, you know, life is just so busy and you come in so hectic and crazy and it's really just an opportunity to just escape. So if I'm on holiday, um, sitting on, uh, you know, some deck or looking at the sea, uh, it is one thing I like to do is read. Um, you know, I just find it does relax me. It takes my mind off things and it, it energizes me. So, so it is, it is, it is something that, that I'm fascinated by. Um, that said, I'm currently, um, I, I'm not currently reading anything other than forced reading, uh, as a consequence of a program I've just registered for, um, on capitalism. Um, so, oh, gosh. Yeah, so um, from communism to yeah, yeah, capitalism. Um, capitalism. So, so um, I know very little about the concept of capitalism. I've mm -hmm. never studied geopolitics or you know ideologies like communism, capitalism, uh, socialism, and the like. And and um, you know it's it's been offered by the University of Chicago, which I'm an alma mater and and uh, so an, an alumni. And um, um, you know, they, they are sort of a, a faculty or a school that is very prominent in the economic sphere. Uh, and I felt that, you know, if I'm going to learn something, this is a great place to learn it. And uh, there was an opportunity presented to me to apply for participation in the program. They basically take, I don't know, uh, 15 or so people across the world uh, into it. And it's an 11 or 12 week program. And what you do is you basically get a whole lot of readings, um, uh, you know, uh, tons of readings. Um, so over the last two weeks I've, i think i've read about a thousand pages um of right. text and uh, uh and a book uh, called the company it's it's a it's 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 a book that basically talks about the formation of companies and you know goes back into time as to how they sort of arrived and 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 along along that way kind of talks about the the merits or demerits of capitalism and capitalist oh. ideas and so for me um what what's great about this is is when i'm learning something um it is interesting um and 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 the reason i was i was quite keen to sort of uh learn about it was just um this notion of inequality i'm finding that is something that i'm really struggling with as a human um as a person um and it's not just inequality that we observe here in south africa which you know is obviously the by far the worst in the world you know societally at least um but it's inequality of nations of companies you, you you look at for example the big nations they're just growing bigger uh, the smaller nations are just getting smaller you know within nations societies you know the the the, the rich are getting richer the poor are getting poorer um organizations companies you look at the big seven the magnificent seven as they call them in the u.s i think they account for something like 30 percent 31 percent of total share value on the stock market, seven companies. Which are some of those seven? So like the likes of Meta, uh, okay. Apple, uh, oh, all the tech, yeah, all the tech uh, companies, all the, you know, all the big tech uh, sort of organizations. And, and just that gap seems to be widening. And for me, I want like an answer to that. I want to understand what's driving it. And, and, um, uh, and I want to understand what's possible to kind of like prevent it because I don't think it's good that we have such level i mean it's certainly not good that we have such levels of inequality across all spheres and so that's kind of like what motivated me to get into into um into this program and so the book or the reading that i'm currently doing is like forced reading you know through this program so yeah so that's kind of like what i'm involved with at the moment i'm very curious now about the the writing within this gentleman gentleman in moscow do you have a quote from that book? i have a quote i sent it through um I yeah so there is a, there is a quote that um that really resonated with me. Um, it says, yeah, if a man does not master his circumstances, then he is bound to be mastered by them. Um, and I think, I think what you'll find, um, uh, throughout, uh, was a common theme across most of the books. In fact, all the books that are, that I sent through, um, is this theme of resilience. Um, you know, I find that, that, uh, uh, and it's something that appeals to me. Um, uh, at a personal level, resilience is something that I've had to rely on to kind of like deal with um difficulty and challenging sort of times um 
And it's it's resilience that I think is is the thing that stood out for me the most. And here is a guy who 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 was uh, an elitist, um, had all sorts of privilege, you know, rightly or wrongly, he had privilege, and suddenly mm -hmm. that had been taken away from him, um, and how he had to respond to that. Um, and I think your response um, to change, um, particularly harsh change, uh, I think is what makes you what you might be uh, one day. Uh, I think that's what defines you. Um, and and for me. You know, it's 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 kind of like a theme that I think I quite like in books is 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 characters that demonstrate that resilience. You know, that that toughness, that 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 strength in character. I'd like to touch on that by you know talking a bit about your your upbringing and your backgrounds. So you mentioned that your parents had a shop. Yeah. You know, did you how how did you go from you know that upbringing to you know to something very academic and then you know later to entrepreneurial again, I guess. You know, was that yeah, it was completely by accident. I mean, uh, you know, so we were brought up with this, you know, in this business. In fact, my parents were both uh, immigrants from, from Greece, uh, both born and raised in Greece um, and left Greece consequence of what was going on in Greece at the time. You know, the, the Second World War was devastating on Greece. Um, shortly after that, there was a civil war um, where there was a communist uprising um, and that was even more devastating for Greece. And then just after that, there was this massive earthquake that, you know, uh, was, was incredibly damaging. So, so jobs were scarce. People um, had no prospects and, and, and were forced economically to basically pursue opportunities globally. Um, um, my father had a cousin that was based uh, in Maputo, uh, what was then known as Lorenzo Marx, and it was she that encouraged him to come out to South Africa. And so he did that. His brother followed suit and, and uh, you know, being people that didn't speak, read or write English, were forced into a trade of, you know, uh, you know, shopkeeping, um, you know, working for somebody, you know, in a shop, uh, a sort of cash business. Um, uh, and then he got his opportunity to open up his own and kind of like that's how uh, things started for him. Um, was it like a corner shop? Like a, it was a, like a cafe? It's exactly that stereotype, yeah. you know. So, yeah. so, so we were in a corner and it was a cafe. Uh, and so, so um, you know, my mother and my, so he went back to basically marry my mother. It was an arranged marriage. Um, mm -hmm. She then came out. I mean, she met my dad and within two weeks uh, was now living in a foreign country, uh, having to speak a foreign language. Um, it was really tough. Not knowing anybody, uh, it was really, really tough. Um, and so that's kind of like what they knew. Um, uh, you know, we were raised in, 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 in that sort of, uh, family. We never once went on holiday together. They basically worked seven days a week, 16 hour days, 365 days of the year. So we never, we never got to see our parents other than when we were at the shop. So, so kind of like that's where we were brought up. Um, but um, it taught us many things, you know, like being in the shop taught us, um, firstly, the struggle uh, that, that that's needed to kind of like just survive. Um, uh, we understood the, the, the value of, of, of ethical work and, 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 and important work. Uh, uh, you know, the value system that came out of it was, was second to none. Um, we, we, so academically, I was not bad at school, but, you know, uh, I, I never knew of this world of actuarial science. It was never something that was known to us. I mean, back in those days, it was, it was obviously something that was not that well known anyway. Um, uh, but I, I sort of stumbled it across, stumbled across it in my final year of school in my matric year, where I went for social counseling to help me understand what it is that I might be good at and what it is that I should study. My plan on studying was to basically get a degree and then go back straight to the, the, the business and help my dad and take over the shop. That was kind of like my, the, the plan. And uh, when I stumbled across actuarial science, which I was encouraged to look at, it, it kind of like, uh, it, it appealed to me because it, it had maths as a key sort of subject um, and what and, and business. Uh, but I didn't appreciate the nature of the, or the type of business, you know? So I kind of like went into it fairly cold. Mm -hmm. There was very little in terms of research. There was absolutely no actuary I could speak to. So I arrived um, at university, not really knowing what an actuary is all about, but excited by the prospect of getting a degree in three or four years and then going back to the business, you know? Um, anyway, my, my, my life at varsity was, was, was not bad. I, I loved it socially. And then when I finished, I, I went back to the, the business. Of course, at that stage, the business was taking strain because the, the supermarkets were, were growing, uh, you know, the big spas were growing. And so we were unable to compete with them. And so, you know, the struggle of uh, maintaining both myself and my dad in the shop or, you know, it was just not possible. So I had to go and find uh, work at the time Alexander Forbes were interviewing, um, 
And so on hands and knees, I basically begged for a job. I believe literally. Literally, I was on hands and knees. I begged for a job. Uh, I went to the interview and I, I think they've never seen anybody literally get down on his knees and actually ask for the job. And that's exactly what I did. Interview tips. Yeah, interview tips. Yeah. Um, and I think they saw in me somebody that just had this, this um, I guess, this eagerness to, 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 do, to do work, you know, yeah. um, and uh, employed me. And, and my first job was that of an archive archive filer you know um at the bottom of end street you know, the business was based in uh sour street in joburg but i was sent to end street um in the archives and all i was doing was filing for two months in a suit um uh kind of like so that was my i wasn't even a trainee actuarial assistant i kind of like you know that was my role and that's how i started um okay but you had an actuarial degree yeah, so I got the degree and then and then because of that degree, um, eventually got into the actuarial team as a trainee actuarial assistant and got to work for Graham Kerrigan, who who remains as remains one of the most inspiring people for me. Um and, and that's what kind of like motivated me to then pursue the field. Um so I registered with the Institute of Actuaries and started the exams and and thankfully got through them relatively quickly. Absolutely loved the the profession. And I must say it's been the best thing I've ever done. I love being an actuary. I love the actuarial field. And it's been so good to me. Um, you know, given where I came back came from, it's it's been so good to me that I felt I needed to give back, which is why I'm sort of involved with the society. It's not just recent. I mean, the Retirement Matters Committee before this, you know, council now, um, you know, the work that we do, um, it's 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 just to give back because it's just been so good to me. So yeah, that's why I'm involved. So that's my journey. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, very like a two minute version. I'm yeah. excited to hear more about it. Um, but what's the next book we'll talk about today? Uh, a book. Uh, the next book of what I've, I've I maybe read. Um, mm. We can talk about um, so that where the crawdads sing is an interesting book. Um, oh, I love that one. You like it? Have you read it? Yeah, I've yeah. Read it. Um, so I, I picked it up because I was told it's light reading. <laughs> so 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 which was unlike the, the the gentleman in Moscow. Yeah. And and I I also loved that book. I found it. Um, I actually binge read uh, binged read that. You one. have I I read, to. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. I wanted to get to the end. Yeah. Uh, and so I think I finished it in a day and a half or whatever. Um. Uh. You know, on a December holiday down in Durban. Um. So it was right by the pool, listening to some music in the background. Perfect. Enjoying good weather and just loving the story and imagining the story. And unlike Gentleman in Moscow, whose movie I have not yet seen, I saw the movie that subsequently came out. Yeah. Actually, I wasn't disappointed with it. I thought it was a, a fairly good um, uh, demonstration of, of, of the book. Um, and one that was not necessarily inconsistent with what was in my head. You know? yeah. So I quite enjoyed uh, that book. And again, it's, it's, it's that resilience uh, that appealed to me, that the strength in that character, um, in that, in mm. that girl's, uh, in Kyra's sort of character and the strength to kind of like get through what it is that she had to face, um, that appealed to me. Um, so I, I just loved that um, about that book. Uh, but it was easy reading, I must say. I, and it was just a great story. Yeah, and it's written like poetry. Yeah, exactly. But easy reading poetry. Easy reading, yeah, it's easy reading. So it was just a, a very enjoyable book. And if anybody has never read a book, um, that is a, that is serious book to start. That, you can, that you can start with. It's, it's just a wonderful read. Um, do you like a physical book or do you read on Kindle, audio book? I prefer a physical book, uh, but I find that accessing a physical book these days is just a bit more challenging. So, so I kind of, I, I do both, uh, but I do prefer, I do prefer the physical book. I like the feel of the paper and being able to turn. And I think what, what makes it more special is, is the fact that, um, you can see the pages that you have read. <laughs> You kind of like can see that you're getting towards the end. Of course, you can do that with a Kindle as well because it yeah. gives you the percentage. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, when you see it, it just feels better. I don't know. I just I prefer the, the physical feel of the book. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like they are definite camps of people and then their preferences and all are valid, I suppose. Um, do you have a favorite quote from, from okay. this book? Yeah. yeah. So, so um, a quote that I did, um, that did resonate with me, uh, was, um, yeah, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. Um, and again, um, I think that, that quote sort of talks to 
um, the main character's closeness with nature, um, which also appeals to me. Um, I love nature. I love the wild. I love, I love the bush. Um, uh, we have a home in Belito, which is in a forest. Um, and it gives me no greater pleasure than to travel there and just escape. Um, so I love, and for me, nature is an escape. It is like a book. Um, it is that escape that, uh, that appeals to me and it gives me that peace of mind. It allows me to kind of like think, to gather my thoughts, to kind of like, you know, um, contemplate stuff. Um, uh, so for me, that is appealing and, 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 and that's certainly uh, very, very present in, in the book. Yeah. I'm interested in, um, how you came to start Colorfield. First of all, where's the name from? Okay. And then. A more general question, what is liability-driven investment? Okay, no, it's a great, two great questions. So Colorfield has got nothing to do with financial services, as you can appreciate. Um, it's, uh, it's in fact an art movement. So I'm a big lover of the arts. Okay. Uh, yeah, my, my favorite artist is William Turner, um, a massive, massive lover of his, his work. Uh, I love the drama in color, and that's what he has. If you look at any of his paintings, um, uh, or his work, um, he basically makes landscapes, uh, he brings them alive. Um, you know, like he'll, he'll, when you look at his work, it's, it's almost a picture and you can see the movement. And that I think is what, 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 you know, what, what I love about his work. Um, Colorfield was an art movement that was started by two artists, um, Rothkowitz and Gottlieb about a hundred or so years ago. So it's literally to the day. Um, at that time, art was very much doom and gloom. Um, you know, the, they'd just gone through the First World War. There was the Russian Revolution. There was their pandemic. You know, you'll remember, well, you won't remember, but I mean, there was the pandemic of a hundred or so years ago. You would have studied about it. Uh, and so every artist basically painted stuff that was just, you know, full of doom and gloom, it, it miserable sort of stuff. And these guys came along and it was uh, a brush of color, uh, freshness, um, you know, just a change. And, and, and when we were thinking about a name, um, we felt that that as a movement kind of like resonated with what it is that we were about. We, we wanted to get into asset management. Uh, we were all actors. Who's we? I'll, I'll give you an So it's basically my former university professor, Dr. Nick Sennett. Okay. Um, who, who, uh, and, and Sean Leverton. Um, so it was, it was um, the three of us that basically um, formed the company. We also had um, two colleagues who joined us from Alexander Forbes, uh, Terry Gafson and Troy Duplessis. So there were five of us. And when we sort of thought about the name, what, what, what resonated with us is that these guys were different at a time where difference was needed. Um, and so that's what we wanted to be. We wanted to be investment actuaries that did asset management in a very different way. Um, okay. So that's where the name comes from. And if you look at the name, it's got, if you, if you look at the word color it's got olo and that olo becomes can look like a percentage sign and of course that appealed to to the actuaries in us um who figured that out yeah we, graphic it, designer we are no it wasn't we actually didn't have a graphic designer at the start but uh um, okay. yeah so i guess i guess i guess it was collective um you know terry terry uh you know being the the only lady amongst us was the most creative amongst us. So, so I think, I think we owe a lot to her for her creativity. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so what we do is, 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 uh, you know, we, we call ourselves liability driven investment managers and, and really what an LDI manager is, um, is, is when you manage money, you manage money with a specific objective of following or tracking, uh, the liability of the institution that you're managing money for. So if you look at a pension fund. It's got assets and liabilities. The liability is, you know, the present value of a series of cash flows from day to day, from month to month, those, that value sort of changes because of things like interest rates and inflation. So what we do is we build portfolios that'll basically track that change. So, so we almost like a de-risking solution. We, we effectively take risk off the table and we help secure the obligations that those institutions are, are, are obliged to pay. So, so we secure the ability to pay the pension and we secure the ability to provide increases on that pension. So the business has been, um, you know, and when we engineered the concept, it was the first time ever in South Africa that you had uh, an LDI solution. So we, you know, were innovative um, in terms of, you know, bringing it to the market. But of course, the challenge was in educating the market of their need for such a solution. And, and it was just, it was a really tough time. I think the first sort of year or two of our business, um, it was really tough. Uh, we had, we had, um, numerous appointments, new business opportunities, 
uh, you know, presentation second to none. And, you know, uh, at the end of the year, I think we had one appointment, um, that we had to show for all that effort. Uh, so, so it was a tough time to try and sort of, um, get through, um, but thankfully, and, 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 and not to take it for granted in any way or form, um, the business has demonstrated success. We've been able to secure wonderful appointments, amazing clients, you know, um, and, and, um, yeah, the business has grown from strength to strength. We now, we don't employ lots of people. We've got in total about 14 people of which seven are actuaries. Um, uh, there are three actuarial students. Um, so it's very actuarially sort of dominated, um, because of the nature of what it is that we're tracking, um, as a, as a benchmark, you need to understand liabilities and what's, what's driving them. But all the actuaries and all the sort of folk involved have also got the sort of, you know, important investment skill, um, and, and qualification and experience. And so, so that's kind of like what we, what we do. Yeah. Uh, in the defined contribution fund space, which is, you know, unlike the defined benefit fund space, um, we've, as a consequence of, you know, networks, we've also been able to connect with you know, famous people across the world. So Bob Merton, Professor Robert Merton, um, who is the Nobel Prize laureate. We are personal friends with him. We've done work with him. Um, he's collaborated with us on a solution that we are um, sort of taking to the market. The market has responded very encouragingly uh, by it. Um, so yeah, so, so, so notwithstanding that we're a small business, our sort of line of sight and our reach has been amazing. Um, uh, we're very humbled by, by, just the extent to which we've been able to connect with these, these folk, um, and some of the opportunities that have been presented before us. So it's been an amazing journey. Um, and if I were to do it all over again, I absolutely would as much as it's been a tough journey. Yeah. On a very practical note, that first year when, you know, you had meeting after meeting without success, how did you sustain yourself? Did you have savings? Um, you know, what, yeah, what, um, what was so the plan? Uh, so, yeah, so this is. Um, it's, it's not to be recommended, but I basically went into significant debt. Uh, you know, my, my sort of decision at the time was motivated by, so we had an, an unfortunate incident of crime, um, occurred to me. Um, uh, when I was, whilst I was at Alexander Forbes, I had this thing happening to me and I got quite rattled by it. Um, at the time twins had just been born, um, you know, they were like 18 months old and, and that's what rattled me. And, and so what, what I was encouraged to do, so, so, I, and, and I'm, I'm a big lover of South Africa. I'm, I'm somebody that's completely committed to South Africa's cause and, and, and the country, you know, like I absolutely love it. And this is, this is despite the fact that many of my peers, people that I studied with, a lot of them have, have in fact left. Um, I was, I was very committed, but this incident of crime rattled me a bit and and um i was encouraged at that point to uh to look at doing an mba uh, but with one of the big sort of schools globally because that's what gets you into a network and and that's what might create an opportunity and you know i picked up the economist and the economist does a survey annually of of the best mba schools and at the top was the university of chicago so i thought you know what, I'm going to just try with them, you know, apply. Anyway, I went through a very rigorous um, sort of process of applying and what have you uh, and managed to get in. And of course, um, having got in, um, I suddenly was doing this program. And I think that's what gave me the confidence to step out of my comfort zone and actually try something on my own. But when I left Alexander Forbes, I didn't leave with, you know, a whole lot of savings. Uh, in fact, what I ended up doing was... Um, taking my retirement fund savings, it's the exact thing that you should not be doing and then investing it in the business. So uh, I invested it in the business. Um, we didn't have any clients, uh, you know, there were five actuaries in the business. So of course, an expensive business to run, but I just went into debt. And, and so the incentive to, to try and make it work was growing by the day. Um, my, my backstop in sort of doing it was, I felt that, you know, um, if this thing doesn't succeed, I'll then go back to a corporate, um, job and, you know, continue to work in the way that I did before. And that would sort of get me out of, uh, whatever, um, sort of difficulty I might have faced. Um, but I just loved the people I was doing this with and, and, and that's kind of like what kept me there and, and our drive and passion to succeed is what kept us motivated. So, so, and of course the fact that we had a whole lot of debt against us, uh, meant that we had to make it work. And so that's, yeah, it's funny how debt kind of like 
you know, focuses your attention and, uh, you know, success or achieving or trying to yeah, achieve sure. success. So it, it kind of like gave us the, the drive that we needed to, but you know, you, 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 you know, when you have, I don't know, we had like 264, I think meetings the first, the first year, and we only had one appointment at the end of it. Um, it is a bit demotivating when, when you have that sort of level of success rate <laughs> coming through. But what, what motivated you to stick with it? Um, I just felt we just, you know, we, we were believers in our solution. We yeah. felt our solution and our, 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 the way in which we did things um, actually resonated with what, you know, those funds needed. Um, so that is kind of like what kept us going. It was, um, it was almost the, the, the solution itself. We had such belief in and we wanted to show how it actually does work, you know. Uh, what's the third book we're going to talk about? I hope it's the, the one I want to talk about. Um, so the Captain Corelli's Mandolin. Yeah. So that was uh, another very, very difficult read. I must say the first hundred pages or so of that book, um, I was struggling to understand why it is that I was reading that book because it really like, um, it really, uh, it was a real struggle. The English was really difficult. Um, it was, it was, it's a, it's also a very well-written book. Um, the English is very difficult. I, I found aspects of it, um, in the beginning quite funny. Um, but not enough to kind of like keep me going. So, okay. so I kind of like kept putting it down, picking it up. And the reason I kept picking it up was two things. One, I don't like to stop what I, uh, I started. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm that sort of personality. I'll sort of get to the end regardless of what that thing might be. Um, so I need to finish things off. I don't leave things. I'm, you know, I'm not somebody that like leaves things midway. Um, and the second thing is that I, I had, I think a, a close friend of mine who loved the book. Um, and so, okay. uh, and I trusted her judgment, uh, a lot. So, so I felt that I needed to get to it, you know, and from about page a hundred or so, it starts getting good and starts getting interesting. Um, it's a fascinating story of, um, it's basically a love story set on the island of Kefalonia, um, which for me is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I've, I've visited it three times. Um, and every time I go back, I find and discover something, um, different. Um, it's Did you also, go because of the book? I, I I went because of the book. And in fact, it became popular because of the book. Um, suddenly the world found or discovered Kefalonia. Um, you know, people like Madonna, for example, uh, bought homes in Kefalonia because of, 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 of the movie that was subsequently produced with... Um, Nicolas Cage? Nicolas Cage. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so... Uh, yeah, I, I love the stories. I love the story of the guy, the old man who, you know, was brought up, um, being deaf only to realize in his old age that in fact he was never deaf. It was just that he had a pee, uh, stuck <laughs> in his ear. Um, and, uh, Gross. the doctor removed it and suddenly he could hear. But what I loved about that story or that part of it is that he went back a few days later to say, please put the pee back in because, you know, my wife is, is shouting at me and I can't handle it anymore. So. So, so I love that. I love that aspect of it. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it, the love story is amazing, you know, uh, an Italian officer and a, a local girl, and it's just, you know, the crossing of boundaries, um, you know, it's just amazing. Uh, and of course for, for Greece, um, uh, it was particularly poignant, um, that, that particular time, I mean, uh, just the other day, the 28th of October is celebrated as Ochi Day, um, which mm. means no. Um, and that was the first time ever that the, that the, uh, allied powers, uh, won a war against the Axis powers in the second world war. So, and, and Greece's role in that, uh, was defining to the, the outcome of the second world war. And, you know, you'll read quotes of, you know, by Winston Churchill, who talks about the Greeks, um, fighting in the second world war and, and, and how they shaped the outcome of the war. They, 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 the consequence of the defeat, uh, you know, of Italy, um, meant that the Germans had to then go in, uh, and I think the Greeks resisted for about 10 months, which I think was the longest amongst all the European nations, mm -hmm. uh, but they eventually fell. But that, that war, uh, between Germany and Greece, um, is what ultimately led to Germany delaying its, its approach into Russia, um. And, uh, so much so that they had to go in, in the winter. And ultimately it was that, that was key and instrumental to their defeat. Um, so, so, so for me, it was, it was, it was relevant amongst many, many sort of, uh, areas. And there is a quote that, that, that comes from the book that I've actually used at least twice at a wedding, um, where I've been either an MC or a best man of love. Um, if I may read. Yes, uh, please. Yeah. So, so the quote talks of, um. Um, goes as follows. It says, love is a temporary madness. 
it erupts like volcanoes and then it subsides. And when it subsides, you have to make a decision. You have to work out whether your roots are so entwined together that it is inconceivable that you should ever part because this is what love is. And I think that is, you know, that is, that is, that is so key. That is so true. And, uh, you know, anybody contemplating married life, uh, for example, uh, or a long, or a long partnership with anybody should read this quote. I think it's so powerful because, you know, it, it, it really is how it's been to be, you know, uh, it, 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 it really is quite defining. Yeah. I'm interested in how you view your identity because you love South Africa, you know, born here, uh, passionate about the South African future, yet very strongly Greek, I, yeah, identify as Greek as well. How do you balance those things? How would you define yourself? I think it makes me quite unique. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, there's, there's, I don't know, maybe there's a hundred thousand others that are both Greek and South African. I think if you talk to all of them, I think there is a strong sense of pride um, of the place they come from or from where their ancestors come from. Uh, and at the same time, I think there's a huge love for South Africa and what South Africa has, has done for them as a family. Um, you know, bearing in mind, most people that are here that come from that environment came from a difficult time. South Africa presented some mm. opportunity. It wasn't as though the opportunity was an open door opportunity. They had to work hard to basically, you know, get themselves out of poverty, um, you know, help their children, um, you know, get some success. I think the key, the key to success for most of those folk were, was education. I think a lot of them felt that you know, uh, being in Greece would deprive the prospects of their children and their children's children ever having access to an education system. So that was the key. And the fact that they were able to school their children and get their children to go on, you know, become doctors and lawyers and actuaries and engineers and what have you, mm -hmm. is kind of like the success that they were looking for. Um, so I think, I think yet, yet one cannot ignore, um, what Greece was for them. Um, and, and, and certainly I, you know, as, as somebody who is a Greek South African, um, uh, I, I have a strong sense of, um, you know, um, uh, pride, uh, for, 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 for the Greek that, that, um, for, for Greece and Hellenism and, and what Greece has taught me and my people, uh, and what it has done for the rest of the world. It's something that I reflect on often. And I, I absolutely love that. Um, uh, yet, you know, given what I've experienced in South Africa, um, you know, it's also been an, it's been a remarkable time to have grown up in South Africa, you know, like to have witnessed the fall of apartheid, to have witnessed the success that this country has, has had and, 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 and it's challenges as well. I think we've had some enormous challenges and we continue to have enormous challenges. And I think that makes it for a very interesting place. Um, um, but I'm very passionate about this place. So. Yeah, don't ask me who I'd be supporting if, if Greece were to ever play against South Africa in the game of soccer. I, I have no sense. I, yeah, I'd be quite indifferent between... Uh, yeah, I'd be happy either way. Yeah, I'd be happy either way. Yeah. Um, I know Greece would never play South Africa rugby because Greeks aren't great rugby players. And equally, I don't think South Africa would ever play Greece um, a, a, in a game of basketball. Um, you know, so, so, so thankfully our paths don't cross that often. Um, but, but, you know, I'm, I'm proudly Greek when Greece is playing and I'm proudly South African when South Africa plays. I love both places. I make a point to go back to Greece at least once a year and, uh, love being there. A lot of our family is still there. My cousins, aunts, uncles, a lot of them are still there. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just love the place. It's beautiful, but, but, you know, South Africa is certainly the most special for me. Yeah. Okay, South African time. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, in terms, maybe I'm a confused Greek South African, but, I, but I'm a strongly Greek South African. So that's my identity. It's, it's a unique identity. I have, I have a leg in each place, you know. And luckily, you, you can be both. Yes, exactly. No reason not to. Yeah. So I think we have time for two other honorable mentions. Maybe if we can list them and, and tell me what you, what you love about them. Yeah. So there's two other people and these are biographies, uh, which I just, I generally don't read. Um, uh, the first is, is Nelson Mandela, who for me was an interesting character because I brought, I was brought up, um, in an apartheid regime where I was told that this is a man that's a terrorist, you know, mm -hmm. that's, we were. You know, like that's what was going on in our, in our homes, you know, like our media was censored. What we got to see was not the reality of the, 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 the situation. Um, 
Uh, but when I sort of, as I grew older, I began to think for myself and, and, and the, you know, human rights and, and the sort of right to, to live freely in a place, um, you know, started becoming an important thing to me. And when I went to university, um, I kind of like witnessed it firsthand. And so, so his struggle, his journey, uh, really was interesting to me. Uh, and, and what he did in saving South Africa from a civil war, which he had every ability to basically enact uh, is to this day for me absolutely miraculous like i'm of, i'm i'm always emotional when i think of that because we're literally teetering on the brink of a civil war at the time and the fact that you know when 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 chris harney's assassination took place kind of like that's the sort of thing that creates wars you know like uh it's that sort of um uh it's that sort of event that kind of like completely um, you know, brings a nation down. Mm. And what he did when he had the power to pursue a war and he had the power to basically take what was rightfully something that he would have had access to, um, for him to have encouraged um, kind of cohesion and, and um, diplomacy and, and discussion and peaceful transition, I think was just remarkable. Um, uh, you know, so, so I think, I think for me, he's like, a hero um and and you know not that i want to throw religion into this but when they talk about you know a second coming you know it's that sort of person that is representative of what a second coming might look like you know it's that's that's the sort of significance that i think he had in my world you know? so and the world of around us you know so so for me um his journey was 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 really um remarkable and and i mean there are many books by by, by nelson mandela but um the one that, um, you know, in his book, Long Walk to Freedom, which is, I mean, it should be a uh, compulsory reading, I think, for everybody in this country. Uh, and in fact, not just this country, I think it should be compulsory reading for everybody, because I think there are such lessons in that. You know, the American politicians, I think, would, would, would stand to gain tremendous uh, just by reading his story. So, I mean, it's quite a long quote that I've got here. Um, it says, yeah, I've walked that long road to freedom. I've tried not to falter. I have made missteps along the way. But I've discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I've taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me. I look back on the distance I've come, but I can only rest for a moment, for with freedom comes responsibilities, and I dare not linger, for my long walk is not ended. And I think that talks to, certainly like it, it feels as though like if I read this about kind of like my journey, there's, there's a lot of stuff there that like resonates with me. Um, and it's inspiring to kind of like hear leaders like that talk about kind of like the journeys that they've had to go through to get to the point that they are. I think that is, that is a huge thing. So yeah, I got goosebumps listening and listening to that and it's fantastic. being reminded of the, of the miracle. No, it's an amazing thing. And I think when people start accusing our government and accusing our you know, like what goes on about various things. I'm not suggesting that these are not, these are false accusations. Of course they're not. Um, everybody wants, wants what's right for the country. But where we came from and what we've achieved is, is miraculous. And we must hold on to that miracle and just build on it because I think our potential is enormous. You know, like uh, the diversity of people and skill and culture that we have here is second to none. And I think diversity is hugely powerful. So that, that is something that, that really resonates with me. Unity and diversity as, as our national motto goes, yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the last thing I want to, the last book I want to talk of is, is a book of a, a person that for me has been incredibly iconic. And if, if you were to say, who's my sporting hero, Rafael Nadal represents that. You know, disappointingly, um, like it's been a dark man for me because he's just announced his retirement. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but, but. I'm he, burning, but, so. Yeah. He has been somebody that has been hugely inspiring and he's been inspiring for, for, for various reasons. One, I think his, his humility is, is incredible and second to none. Um, his sportsmanship is, is incredible and second to none. His, um, his grit and his determination is really what appeals to me about him. Like, I love the fact that he's just such a fighter, that he just mm -hmm. never gives up. Um, and I think if there is an inspiration out there of somebody that, despite injury, of which he's had much, um, despite difficulty, of which he's had much, um, to rise above that and still succeed, I think, is, 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 is incredible. And again, it's this theme of resilience, you know. Um, 
you know, he, if you look at his sort of track record, he has been by far the most injured amongst the, the sort of top players and his success is, is remarkable. I think if you, if you, I think he's missed something like, I don't know, 23 grand slams, um, through injury, you know, so he's just not, and it's the nature of his game. Um, it's so physical, which means that his body takes a lot more damage. And, and despite that, he, you know, when he does, when he is healthy and he is able to play, he kind of like gives more of himself, you know, like Roger Federer, I think is a more talented player, you know, he's got the edge of, on him, you know, Novak Djokovic is the, you know, another guy that's got amazing grit, a great, a great mental strength, very talented, but his head to head against Nadal in the key moments is not as good as Nadal's. So, so it's just an amazing, amazing, um, he's an amazing guy. So, so it's quite, it's quite displeasing for me that he's actually now come to an end in terms of his tennis career. But yeah, they, they, the quote that he's got in his story, in his biography is, says, enduring means accepting, accepting things as they are and not as you wish them to be. And then looking ahead, not behind. So it's that acceptance that you might have challenges, you might have difficulties, put those behind you and move forward, you know, um, look ahead. And I think we can all sort of learn from that, you know, like we often feel, you know, like an actual student failing an exam, you can sit and, you know, you know, uh, be miserable and upset about it, but, but that doesn't help the situation. You've got to accept it. Or you might not have been able to make an exam because, you know, of difficulties with work or whatever it might be, accept it, move on. You know, like there's life's too short. You can't sort of sit and ponder on what might have been, think of what could be. And, and, and that's what one, you know, must look, look towards. So. So yeah, so that's another book that I think was was great. Okay, so those are five amazing books. Um, A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Towles, uh, Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens, Captain Curly's Mandolin by Louis de Bernier. Yeah. Is that, is that the right pronunciation? Rafa, My Story by Rafael Nadal, and Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela. I ask everyone the same question. If I had to be very cruel and send you away to a desert island with only one of these books, which one would it be? Sure. That's a really difficult question. Um, with only one of these books, uh, yeah. I, I guess probably Mandela. Uh, along, yeah. Yeah, I guess it will keep you busy the longest as well. Back, yeah, it's by far the longest. That's uh, But not the most difficult of reads. The most difficult of reads was, I think... Um, I guess that Captain Corelli's mandolin was tough uh, to get through. The first hundred pages were tough, but I mean, it's just a beautiful It's so rewarding. Beautiful yeah. story. Yeah, I remember the, also the, the love story between the, the soldier and his ally, right? Which is also yeah. very special. Yeah, right, it's special. And it, 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 again, it talks about cross-cultural boundaries and things like yeah. that, which, which was also, uh, you know, when the book, when the book, uh, was 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 released um yeah that was obviously a theme you know like in modern society so it was it was interesting to kind of like get a sense of you know how that played out yeah the last question actually double barreled question yeah first um you know what are your plans for assas or in during you know the rest of your term as president and where can people get hold of you if they'd like to follow your journey oh right okay so um the, the, the last question I'll deal with first because it's easy. Yeah. Just call me. Uh, my number is 082-852-6031. I'll put it or, on. Or, or you send me an email, costa at colorfield.co.za. I believe I've got an ASA address, president at... Uh, Actuarialscience.org. Dot, yeah. yeah. And I'm completely accessible. Anybody can get hold of me. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on uh, Facebook. Um, you know, I'm not. Uh, you know, if you need to get hold of me, you will get hold of me. And and I'm always available. So so please, by all means, get hold of me. Um, uh, if you need to chat about anything. So that's that's always a thing. In terms of ASA, you know, I'm I'm lucky in that I'm I'm. I'm accompanied on my journey by amazing people. You know, the people at, at council, the people at the at the office, they're all amazing people. And so my journey is a lot easier than it would be normally, I think. Um, we've got great thinkers, people that actually want to do the right thing. You know, I, I you know, everybody, I guess every president um uh, or every person at council um feels like they want to make a difference um and, and certainly the reason they're involved is because they want to make a difference and and one mustn't underestimate the sort of extent of time it takes outside of your normal life to try and make a difference um uh i got involved because i want to make a difference i want to give back because i think the profession has been 
incredibly uh, meaningful to me and and um, you know life changing to me. For me, it's important that as a profession, um, we recognize what it is that we have as a skill, um, and yes. that that we are seen to be relevant. You know that actually, when people think of the actuarial profession. They think of a good place. They think of a, an organization that is actually helping to change and make a difference. And of course, here in South Africa, there are huge things that we need to tackle. You know, like you look at the retirement fund system and the the the, the lack of provision amongst the, the broader base, um, the, the the lack of social security. Um, you know, in, in your world, NH or in the business world of, of insights, NHI, for example, um, is a massive thing. I mean, there's no doubt that we need broader healthcare coverage. Um, you know, actuaries are people that just have the skill set to kind of like understand those issues um, and help solve those problems. And, and there are many. I mean, you know, our infrastructure and um, our government's balance sheet and the ability to use capital uh, of institutions in a deliberate way that doesn't compromise those institutions' fiduciary responsibilities, but at the same time um, ensures that the capital, when deployed, is actually creating, you know, um, jobs. It's creating sustainable sort of energy and water sort of rights and privilege. I mean, these are things that are are hugely important, and I think as a profession, we are so well poised to kind of like make such a meaningful difference. And 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 relevance is the key sort of theme. Um, that 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 we've taken on as a council. So so if I can, in any way, um, you know, help to change that, and I I cannot do it alone. I certainly you know uh, recognize the task before me. Uh, but if we can even make a dent on that, I think it would be fantastic. So so that's kind of like what we're hoping to do. It's just to 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 increase our relevance. It's not to say that actuaries have not been relevant in the past. Of course they have. But it's to continue to be relevant. And of course, to be relevant, you've also got to be appropriately transformed. And I think one of the things that as an organization we have recognized is that as much as we've done a lot of stuff in terms of helping achieve that objective, um, it's not at the level and pace at which we think is acceptable to us all. Um, so we are doing some deliberate things in terms of helping to change that um, and, and trying to understand why it hasn't changed as quickly as we'd like it to change. So. So very exciting times and very exciting time to be uh, involved with ASA. Um, and, and ASA as a body, I think, just a, an exceptional organization, highly regarded amongst the global actuarial fraternity. We always punch above our weight. We, we, we tackle on, we, we take on big, big tasks. Peter Withy, for example, the former president of ASA, he's, he's running an AI task team, which is, is one of the two key sort of themes and strategies that the IAA have taken on. Um, so, so as an organization, our members um, are well represented globally and we are highly, highly regarded globally um, uh, for the work that, that, that we as, 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 a, as a South African body does. Compliments too to the, the strong academic foundation um, that generates the students that, that we need to basically get into the system and, and, and certainly working alongside them um, and all the participants, all the volunteers, the honoraria members, you know, um, everybody that has any role to play. I mean, it's, it's a massive of, it's a massive uh, effort and, and it requires that level of coordination um, to, to be successful. So, so yeah, so very excited to be part of the, of the team and very excited to be able to give back um, something, you know. Yeah, we, as members, we're so grateful to have, you know, enthusiastic, passionate people like you leading the profession. So thank, thank you. No, thank you very much. Thank you, Pamela. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank it's been you. wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, the time and uh, really enjoyed uh, meeting and speaking with you and um, yeah best of luck um, uh, for the the balance of the year it's incredible that we're now sort of uh, on the cusp of November um, uh, six or seven weeks of work left and then it's on it feels like it should already be exactly I think we're all exhausted so I have a gift for you <laughs> thank you so much Pam honestly not this thank you so so much I really appreciate it well I Usually I, I like to give books I've read myself, but this is a recommendation from Christoph at oh. Nexus by Yovana Harari. Fantastic. I don't know if you're familiar with his his work, but he wrote Sapiens. and Yes, yes, I've read Sapiens, which is brilliant. So I'm looking yeah. forward to this. This is amazing. Yeah, and personal recommendation from no, Christoph. Thank you so, so much. And thank you, Christoph, then for the recommendation. Um, uh, what, what is also amazing and probably why Christoph also chose it is that um, 
it's such a thick book. I can I, I can actually stand on it and give myself some some height, which uh, as a vertically challenged individual, <laughs> you know, it's something that, that that certainly might come in handy. But no, thank you for thank you so much for this. This is amazing. I look forward to reading it. Uh, yeah, looking forward to your no, your review. I absolutely will. Now, thank you so so much. It'll be when I finish this course, uh, which will be middle of January when I'll get to it, but I definitely will get to it. I look forward to reading about it because Sapiens is just brilliant. Yeah, and I think this has to do with with AI and technology, which, you know, which themes you touched on. Loved it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much. Can I give you a hug? Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cos. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Pan. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. All the best. 